Good morning or afternoon, or in the case of one of our panelists, almost evening. I guess it's still afternoon in Berlin. I'm Eric Schumacher Rasmussen. I'm the conference chair for streaming media, and I'm also the chief marketing officer for Ideas. Welcome to day three of our 10th Streaming Media Connect. We've got five more panels today, and then tomorrow, and I can't believe I haven't mentioned this all week, tomorrow we have a terrific workshop that I hope will appeal to some of the folks who are watching this right now. Uh, drool worthy gear and how to use it. Some of the coolest streaming kit out there uh, and various uh, various folks will be showing off not just the gear, but how to actually use it. So sign up for that if you haven't yet. We're going to be back in person in Boston in May for Streaming Media East, May 18th and 19th. That's a Thursday and Friday this year, switching it up a little bit. On Wednesday the 17th, we'll have the Content Delivery Summit and Streaming Media University Workshops. Both of those websites for Streaming Media East and Content Delivery Summit are live. The programs will be going up very soon. Check it out and register early to get the best deal. Before we jump into our panel on interactivity, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, it seems like on day three, everyone already knows the drill. We've already had someone guess the name of the song that Steve was playing uh, uh, during the, uh, the intro slides. So we'll announce that winner at the end of the session, provided that person is still here, you must be present to win. If you do have questions for our panel, please enter them in the Q&A tab rather than the chat. That just makes it easier for the moderator and I to keep track of them. Uh, also, subtitles are turned on, captions technically. Um, and uh, actually, are they subtitles or captions? I think they're subtitles. Anyway, we can have that debate some other time. Uh, if you want to turn them off, you can go to the bottom of your Zoom screen and click on show captions or hide captions or live transcript or whatever, whatever it says to you and uh, select a disable transcript and that will turn them off. Finally, all of our Streaming Media Connect sessions from this week will be available starting early next week at our YouTube channel. Steve just popped the link to that in the chat. You can always go to streamingmedia.com, click on video and then conference videos and see videos from this and just about every uh, every one of our past streaming media events up there. So it's the gift that keeps on giving. I'd like to thank our diamond sponsor, Signiant, and we have a brief video message from them right now. Wherever content needs to flow, the Signiant platform can move any size file over any IP network. At speeds, it can be up to 100 times faster than traditional transfer methods. More than 50,000 businesses use the Signiant platform to send and share files, automate movement of data between systems, exchange content with global partners, and move content to and from the cloud. The Signiant platform gives you the power to operate at the speed you need to run your business. And I would also like to thank the sponsor of this panel, NanoCosmos. And in fact, uh, Oliver Leeds from NanoCosmos will be joining the panel as Nadine Krefitz leads them in a discussion about the future of connectivity. And uh, we've got seven or eight time zones here. Uh, Nadine's coming in from the West Coast of the United States. Oliver's coming in from Berlin. And we've got folks in between. So Nadine, welcome. Cool. Very, thank you very much, Eric. And uh, I think this will be a very interesting panel. So we'll have Brian, Alex, and Jennifer join us, and we will start off. Very cool. So um, I, I think one of the things that is interesting is, is that we all come from different areas, and so we all have slightly different interpretations of what interactive is. And so I think what I want to do is actually start off by asking people, and we'll start with Alex and, and ask you, you know, to you, what is interactive streaming? Well, I mean, I think that the most the most important part of interactive streaming is how do we interact with the audience? So mm -hmm. it's bringing the audience in and that, that, that definition is very broad, but it can be them playing a game that's part of the, the content. It can be them asking questions, them voting on questions, them chatting along with, with it and, and incorporating those things. Even uh, we've done things where they're even moving or activating things inside of our, our set um, from the audience's interactions uh, during the event. So there's lots of different ways, but it's really how do we tie that viewing audience really uh, viscerally, uh, preferably, into the event that we're actually, that's actually occurring. Okay, so Alex got the interaction, 
Now, Oliver, you've got a specific kind of delivery mechanism. So how do you define interaction for your customers? Yeah, of course, Alex is completely right. And uh, in terms of the interactivity with audience engagement, that's the key. And I see two major use cases for that. The one is more like enterprise corporate space where you have kind of town hall meetings uh, to engage the audience, to ask questions, give any kind of feedback like voting, polling, etc. The other one is more like a monetized uh, revenue channel, which is um, based on things like betting, auctions, gaming elements which directly require ultra low latency to keep up real um, in the real-time space. So that's specific business verticals, which are also covered, which are not uh, so much connected to OTT TV kind of applications, but which have specific business requirements and which is not only focused on the video itself, but the complete use case and the complete workflow of a business um, uh, application. Okay. And it's funny how in terms of terminology, I mean, I once designed into interactive software a long time ago, but Brian, you've got a different environment. What What's your kind of definition of interactive? Yeah, I mean, well, so obviously I live in the TV world, right? So everything I do is, is glass manufactured side of the business. So for me, um, I do need to work within the confines of presentation interactivity on the television itself. I know some of my, um, uh, some of the folks here on the panel, they can probably play with different mediums. But for me, it's all about the TV. So when I think about interactivity, personally, I think about what are we doing to enhance that viewing experience for folks? And it doesn't necessarily have to be limited to the types of use cases for interactivity. But certainly what we don't want to do is cannibalize the core viewing experience that we all know and love. We want to add to it. Okay. All right. Okay. So we've got three different kinds of takes on interactivity. Jennifer, you've done a bunch of different research in terms of that field. So what does it look like to the consumer side? What do they kind of think of as interactivity? Oops. And interactively, we can't hear you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Somebody cool. has to be the person who didn't come off okay. mute. So I'm that person today. Okay. Um, so yeah, from the consumer point of view, right? It's um, I think generally we look at it as moving from a primarily lean back experience to something that's lean in that may be first screen, in screen, in in stream interactivity. Um, it may be a second screen experience. Um, and there's all sorts of different use cases, right? It might be um, inform an information experience where you're getting uh, new live stats within a sports stream for your favorite players or your favorite team. It may be commerce related when we think about shoppable ads and being able to interact with um, advertising for the, for the first time. Maybe a, more like a gaming experience like others have mentioned already, right? Where there's mm -hmm. sort of a gaming element, whether we're talking about wagering gaming or, you know, uh, entertainment gaming. Um, also, uh, you know, kind of navigation even can be interactive in certain ways. Um, so I think from, from, from our perspective, we think about how our consumers using video and communication, especially maybe communicating with others, right. Um, during a stream, others, whether they be strangers or that people who like this content or your family members or friends who aren't with you. So all sorts of different use cases. Um, but primarily that is changing a little bit of that. I'm just passively watching to something that's that's next level, and then I can lean in and, and um, do something different with. Okay, so, and, and I think you've mentioned earlier that younger people have a different method of either viewing or interactivity. What, what goes on there? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, when we test, so Park Associates is a market research firm. We survey 10,000 consumers uh, every quarter. I'm um, asking about different use cases that, that, that they're doing with their media, with their technology, right? What are they using? What are they interested in using? And of course, can look down into the demographics there. Um, certainly, younger consumers um, are used to viewing um, video, shorter form video, more interactive video, and they're very mobile first. So we, we did a survey recently and found that um, in the 30 days prior to the survey, less than half of 18 to 24 year olds told us that they had watched any video of any kind, right? We asked about pay TV, internet streaming video, YouTube, anything, um, but fewer than half had watched 
video on a TV screen. Um, and I'm sure Brian's going to say that his numbers are totally different. So uh, <laughs> welcome that. But what 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 they did tell us is that they're essentially mobile first. So more than half of had watched mobile video of some sort in the past 30 days, but they hadn't all watched on that big screen. And what that just tells us is that they're they're natively kind of interactive video viewers because much of the video that they're viewing already has comment capabilities, like capabilities, you know, um, uh, interactive ads for sure. So I think that that tells us that um, this great topic that we have here today is one that's um, only going to be advancing even on the big screen because our youngest viewers are taking some of that um, experience and expectations with them as they age. Okay. All right. Now, you know, for me, I, I'm actually really curious for you guys, which one do you think is the most either compelling use or the most prominent one? And, you know, this could be anything in any environment since I'm considering interactive here, mobile TV, we're, we're talking about all the mediums that you can use to deliver kind of an interactive experience. But, but Alex, for instance, when you think about kind of all the interactivity that you've been involved with, what's the key thing that people have really resonated with? I mean, the the most common we see is comments. Like comments is the thing, that, that's, the, mm -hmm. that's the first step of this. And one thing I wanted to annotate from what I talked about earlier is I mostly work in live. I've worked in live for the last 15 years. So I think about interactive as live. But before mm -hmm. that, we did a ton of, inter a ton of uh, work in the t early aughts of interact. We really thought that interactive TV would move faster than it did. And um, so a lot of it was building alpha channels, for instance, like mats for everything in the screen. So basically, oh, you see someone using, this is a different level of interactivity I just want to bring up, is that you would see the person, the pot the person's hanging onto. And if you picked up your controller, you could hit it and it would just show you what everything is and you could order it and, and then go back to what you were watching without having to have the friction of actually going somewhere. Um, but that was for us 20 years ago. And we, you know, built a bunch of tests and for some folks and then that kind of just went away but um it's hard to send those mats out i think that when we look at interactivity that had a lot of positive response because people didn't have any friction between when they saw something and when they bought it so that's another layer of interactivity that hasn't happened yet in any kind of mass form that we think is going to be very compelling as that moves forward um, and you really think about how to interact with the audience so one of the things that that uh, um, that you're starting to see like for instance in something like cooking is uh, there are more and more times where they say we're all going to cook together and we're going to send you a list of what you need to buy and you can order that on amazon for you know, amazon fresh and you know so we can tell you that there's there's an appointment to go to there's something to do and you're going to do it with somebody but you're going to need these tools to do it and there's a commerce opportunity there the um uh, so but, so realistically though the the interactive feature now that you think is is more kind of okay. compelling is that is the chat feature or the chat is feature the, is the most common so the, the most, most common okay what i will say is the most compelling is to have um, a positive impact on the actual video in real time um this okay. is we kind of view this as right now as fissionable material because we can't actually control it every time we turn it on it has so much impact that it usually takes down our streams. It takes, it rips things apart. So the most, so what we, I mean, as an example, um, is we had a, a flamethrower. <laughs> so 40 foot flames, not like a little one, like Elon Musk, like a 40 foot flamethrower in a, uh, in a pyro stage. And we had it pointed at something. And if they, and if the people in the audience, in the audience hit fire, the flamethrower, it would basically send in a, send in a command to an Arduino and Arduino would pull a solenoid, the solenoid would pull the trigger and, off this flame would come out. Um, we had a lot of people watching. And the first time they got to it, it was, it was pretty slow. You know, it took a little while for the flamethrower to go off. But as soon as they understood what happened, the um, we got to 140,000 interactions, uh, 140,000 interactions a minute um, of people hitting, you know, just just going crazy trying to get this flamethrower to go off again. And every time we've done that's one example of things that we've done in the past. And it took the it took the event out because the the database our our management system of the database was fine but the but the uh social media's um streaming database couldn't manage that many interactions a, a minute and so the um and so every time we've done it we've seen events like that where we turn something on they can affect okay. the show and it blows the whole show into you know into another level so we know that that's a very very powerful way to interact with the audience okay i want to i want to kind of pull it. people in here and and, yep. and kind of just get the conversation going in terms of the interaction one of the things that you know i, I try to do here especially because we have a lot of people from different points of view is so you've got kind of a, a certain type of, of interactivity available now 
Oliver, you've got customers kind of in a bunch of different areas. Is there one form of interactivity that kind of is more compelling or that you see is used more? Yeah, I see the the largest growing part is the monetized channels like uh, live auctions and betting, okay. et cetera, because you directly monetize the content on the stream. So it's not like indirect to get more eyeballs, more visitors and more and a larger audience on, on your content, but directly you can monetize your content 24-7. Uh, by getting paid um, services around that. So that's uh, a great challenge and that ne really needs to be close to real time compared to other interaction, like which can maybe take five seconds for commenting that might be higher latency acceptable. So there are also different dimensions in terms of technology requirements for these different kinds of applications. Is So realistically though, is somebody who's interacting like with a flamethrower or doing chat, is that the same latency? Yeah, probably not. So the whatever sending a command might be okay with five second latency or triggering the flamethrower or whatever. I don't, don't know if that's real time, but you need to take get it back and forth. So it's in mm -hmm. two directions. And doing a bet or a, a live auction or something that needs to be directly in real time also compared to the real audience, which is on the site, for example. So that's different levels of uh, latency I see here and um, different levels of interactivity. Okay, Brian, we talked once about what you were doing in terms of interaction, but what about the most popular version of interaction that you're seeing that you're delivering already? So yeah, I think for me, it's going to be a little bit different because I'm I'm not going to have one flavor of interactivity. It's really going to be relevant to the content that is the core content, right, that you're watching. Um, because we look at interactive as complementary content or value-added content, ultimately. So if you're watching, um, I'm making this, let's say you're watching a concert, right? It wouldn't make sense for us to say, hey, here's some dumbbells you can buy. Here's stats on, um, you know, football players or something like that. We want to make sure that whatever we present in that interactive layer is relevant to that core content. But I also want to add, um, and this might be different from the other folks on the panel, for us, we typically think of interactive as an interactive overlay layer or uh, L-bar type of presentation layer. So it's it might be different. I mean, I think there's going to be different motivations. There's going to be different ideation that is inherent to what you are trying to do as, as your business, as your brand. Um, with us, we're going to be a little bit more generalized and we're going to focus in though on the specific content that we're overlaying or that we're you know, squeezing back and putting the L bar against. So it's, it's all about, it's all a matter of relevance. Okay. Yeah, in fact, I'm just going to go a little bit deeper on this. Jennifer, is there something you'd like to add here or should I kind of follow up and, and continue on this path here? Yeah, well, just on the on what's most compelling, um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'll, I'll follow up there. And then I, I know you might want to get back to some of the um, exactly how it's done. Right. Um, which you is really, my mind. Right? I knew that's where you're going to go. So <laughs> just before we leave the, the what's most compelling. Um, you know, I thought I might just share and I'll, I'll just talk to it um, to keep the conversation going here. But uh, we did some testing on specific types of interactive features that people are using, what's most common and what they most like, some around sporting uh, interactive features specifically, as well as around um, group watching. So what Al Alex talked about, you know, that that great use case of, you know, doing cooking together with friends you know, the, the um, and I'm really excited about that, uh, but the uh, first, you know, kind of version of that has just been watching a movie together, um, watching, a, starting the stream at the exact same time and maybe having some chat features like Disney's group watch. Some others are doing that as well. Um, the most common today uh, in the sports interactivity world are the most basic, of course, it's looking at interactive stats for your, your team, you know, the, the, the teams or the players. And then uh, you'll you see some streams being able to do timeline jumping, right? So get to that highlight. I don't maybe want to watch the whole match, but I just want to see the goal, and maybe it'll, it'll fast forward me to that that five minutes right before the goal. Um, and then interest actually still follows that too. So the most interest we see are in the most basic features, like um, you know getting that uh, sports stats, and then getting timeline features, and then after that sports wagering. So about a third of sports content viewers today, whether it's streaming viewers or traditional pay TV viewers, sports fans who watch sports on, on TV, um, tell us that they are interested in sports wagering, but you've got two thirds or so who aren't totally sure how that's gonna work, if they're allowed to do it, if it's legal and whether or not they would really do that. 
the group watch features um, actually kind of below that, right? That, that they're still trying to find their base a little bit, about 25% of uh, consumers tell us they're interested in trying a co-viewing feature. Um, you know, I think that there's, there's still some uh, value that needs to be proven there of how those experiences can work well and be interesting. Okay. All right. Let me, let me pop into a question before I go into some of the technical aspects of how you guys are doing this. So we've got a question from Jim here. It says, are you using interactive capabilities included with your webcast platforms exclusively, or have you also incorporated third-party interactive web-based capabilities? If you have incorporated a third-party, how did you deal with latency or delay with web-based is real-time and streaming having a 10 to 15 delay from the time spoke to the viewer sees okay so but, realistically I, yeah so the it depends on the kind of interactivity you're doing um and so for the most part i think that the the obsession with latency now i do a lot of low latency stuff and we, we if i'm interacting mm -hmm. with someone live like right now we need this ultra low latency when it comes to interacting with the audience a lot of times that latency is not as important as people would think um so usually uh, you know when we're doing q a for instance the latency can be 20 minutes it doesn't really matter it's when the, when, it's, when it's time to ask that question um you know a lot of times we uh, a lot of creators think about it because their chat systems are so bad so the because the chat system is such a churn that goes into youtube or facebook or other things like that and the questions are bound up inside of the chat um, it makes you have to have that low latency because you can't figure out what's next. But as soon as you start to separate those things out, you end up with a lot more uh, control and the latency becomes less important. If they are interacting with something live in the event, that latency needs to be a little bit more important, but you have to you just simply manage what you're asking them to do. If they have to move something, <laughs> then they can't. But if they, but the, the low latency is extremely important. Um, if they're interacting live with the show, uh, if they're not, if there's interactions they can have, again, like chat, like Q&A, like all those other things, um, that latency can be uh, considerably higher. The chat usually wants to be lower, but um, but the uh, but it can be considerably higher. And as long as everybody's on the same playing field, it generally works out for them because they see all they see the chat and the video roughly at the same time. Okay, so that's for your systems. Now, Oliver, you've got a slightly different approach to this, don't you? Because you're uh, you're essentially providing the, the services. Do you want exactly, to give us a little yeah, background? So but completely what, what I agree, what it depends on the use case, what you need. And um, for some applications, you might um, be okay with higher latency. But the use cases we are working on are really more like sub-second real time, maybe one or two second max. So that's then somehow in sync with the chat and the voting and the betting uh, with the with the video. And that's required to, to really have that in the same time at the viewer side and to have everybody on the same page here. So, so that's kind of real-time interaction like we do here in the in this panel session together. We have the Zoom platform, then we have the outside audience, the Q and A session which we have here. Doesn't matter if it's five seconds more or less, right? So, but if you have a monetized channel behind that and you directly want to interact with your audience and get answers to their questions back, or maybe do some more with that with the stream, then you need lower latency. So that's the kind of low latency, I would say is probably something like five seconds. It also defines who is who is answering the question, but ultra low meets then something like one second, sub-second more in the real-time space. Okay. Brian, you, you talked a little bit about overlay, so we know you're kind of doing something. So what do you think about, yeah. I mean? No, this is actually, I, I think Alex, you know, hit the nail on the head. Um, Right now, to date, for the most part, for the past few years, we've been doing shoppable TV, right? So that's mm -hmm. basically what's on the screen and what products can we surface as a shoppable moment that's relevant to that content. Um, you know, how important is latency in that scenario? Probably not critical. You know, our latency is not overwhelming to begin with. But, you know, you bring up, since it is very topical, we talk about sports betting as an example, right? So it's one thing to say, you know, let's let's uh, give the viewing audience an opportunity to bet on the game and say who's going to win or who's going to lose. Right. Um, you know, you can take those bets in well ahead of that event. A prop bet's different, though. If I say who's going to, you know, are, is this is this a field goal kicker going to make this field goal or not? I mean, I'm doing that in real time. That's a problem in our world. Because as you well know, I'm sure you've probably tried to watch a game with someone who's in another state or far away, what have you. And um, you might be getting the game five minutes ahead of them, depending on, you know, all kinds of conditions, including bandwidth. So 
there are certain things I think are not going to be served well, at least in the beginning, or at least in, in the state of technology that we are in today. But there are ways to also work around that. So when we start to get into how can you solve for some of these issues, it all comes down to how you're doing it. If you're taking in the content and then you're analyzing that content real time and then saying, okay, I see what's on the screen and now I'm going to present something, that's one way. Another way is if you're fortunate enough, you work with that content owner, operator, broadcaster, what have you, and um, they set marks and those marks you can then take in and, and you're, there's just less overhead and it's a little bit more um, definitive right? As far as that goes. And there's less, there's less chance for error with some of the algorithmic, um, you know, analysis that's happening to, to figure out what's ha happening on the screen and what to present. So it really does come down to a lot of different factors ultimately. Okay. Now, I, I mean, one of the, let's go into the technical side of it a little bit for a moment, and then we'll get to the business models because I think both are very important. So Alex, you had your flamethrower. Did you have to build this? We only had to build the Arduino and the solenoid. The the flamethrower was somebody. Else. It was a Hollywood flamethrower, so it was something we okay. didn't have to do. We only had to build the uh, the interaction to it, the hardware uh, interface. Uh, okay, so, so it was a real flamethrower. It wasn't a vert. It wasn't a digital flamethrower. It was. There was, was a fire truck it, outside. It was okay. <laughs> yeah, it okay. was definitely real. And, okay. and I think that I think that one of the things that we want to look at is. Um, those are the things that people get really excited about. We spend a lot of time paying a lot of attention to how the user feels. Like, do mm -hmm. they feel like something's, um, uh, you know, uh, important? And we find that as we move more towards digital, which we do, we do a lot of digital stuff, but we know as we keep on stepping away from the real world, it's harder and harder to make it visceral. And when we step towards the real world, it makes it more and more visceral. And so we want to, so a lot of times we are trying to figure out how to do things that are in in the actual camera frame in an analog way that you're actually able to interact with. And we also do a lot of things that are virtual. We just know that those virtual things are a little bit more challenging. Okay. We, we've got like these, the, the conversations going on in the chat. If you have a question, please put it in the Q and A just so I see it. Um, now, right now, okay. This is a kind of a combination money and, and functionality thing. So, so Oliver, you've got people who are basically making money or losing money, et cetera, in the gaming environment. So realistically, is that enough to keep them kind of compelled to, to continue to use it because they have kind of a very interesting interaction going on with them? Yeah, absolutely. It's the only way they, it's their business model, right? So it's directly the application and it requires um, interaction capabilities, real-time interaction, otherwise the business wouldn't run. So it's directly part of the application and part of the business. It's not like an add-on service. It's um, a must-have requirement in this case. And for the other cases, as Brian was mentioning earlier, I agree that it's uh, there are often cases like additional requirements, additional nice-to-have expansion uh, things which then um, make the application more um, suitable and more engaging for larger parts of the audience. So you keep the, your main audience then in your main live stream and have maybe a separate application where you have additional elements for interaction with your audience. So it's also, like Jennifer was mentioning, the, the difference between the lean back scenario, the lean in, the lean forward scenario, which are different types of users and which um, creates higher, larger opportunities for the content owners to um, expand their audience to, to more users. Okay, so let's look at this. If we have, it, we don't have, always have the ability to get a flamethrower, right? So, but realistically, we want to give people the technical capabilities to create more interactivity. What are the things from a technical level that we should be looking at? Like Brian, for instance, you know, if you are trying to create more interactive programming, what do you actually really need to be the key technical features that you have? I think for me, the first thing I'm going to do is call Alex and figure out how to use a flamethrower in my business. Right. Um, <laughs> that's a given. Uh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, look, I think it really comes down to what you're trying to ch achieve. I mean, I, I don't want to say there's one right way for anything. There never is, right? And that's the great thing about the world that we live in for everyone on this panel. And I'm assuming most participants too. Um, there's tech is just, it, it's, we've come a long way and there's a lot of different ways to solve for different uh, obstacles, tech blockers, whatever. Um, so there is no one right or wrong way. 
there is a um, an optimized way in many cases. Well, let's say an affordable way. An affordable way. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because, um, yes, I have to be a good steward of economics at the end of the day. I can't just say, you know, it doesn't matter whatever the obstacles may be, there's there's a tech solve at any cost. Um, no, we have to balance, the balance sheet has to balance out. So uh, it really it really varies, but you know, most of the innovation that we do, most of the, uh, the, the new programs that we enact on television is done by way of strategic partnerships. So that adds another variable to the mix, right? So it's not just a one-sided thing where I say, this is my finite costs and this is how I'm going to solve for it. I have to work with a partner and we have to negotiate how that ultimately shakes out. So, you know, if I'm working on sports betting, that's one thing, right? If I'm working on, you know, some sort of, let's just say a duality, I don't want to get into too deep here. It's going to get off topic, but some of the things that you, I think everyone on this panel knows by now is um, I'm quite heavily into the metaverse side of the business, which also, by the way, we've incorporated an interactive component to that as well. But when you think about that, and we're trying to do a whole duality thing where it's like, here's the physical world, here's the digital world, and we want these things to live time synchronized together. Now you have a whole a whole new set of obstacles that you have to work through. Um, so it, it, it really comes down to what you want to do. But what I can say is, as much as possible, you still, you're right, you have to live in the economics, but as much as possible, you have to figure out where you want to transact that interactivity, ultimately. Do I want it to happen on the TV? Do I want it to happen in the cloud? Can I have it happen in the cloud, right? Because now I have economics associated with that as well. Um, but, and, and again, and once we solve for that, and once we figure out the optics on that, that picture, okay, now are we balanced out in terms of the economics, right? Because sometimes you just get to a place where you go, it's not going to work yet right now. Um, and maybe we'll get there in the future. And, and one of the things when it comes, when it comes to economics, um, what I will say is that we, you know, we kind of skipped over this a little bit when we we're talking about most compelling is, in my opinion, the kinetic that I talked about and chat is the most common. The most, the, the most common one that we common use, we um, use um, is, uh, is a little bit of feedback here. Um, yeah, so the... Um, uh, the most, the thing that we use the most is Q and A and interacting with the audience. I I do a show every morning for people who do what we do, media, you know, virtual events and so on and so forth. And we literally start the first hour with just Q and A. <laughs> we answer twenty five questions an hour. Um, you know, and uh, people just come up. I don't understand how this USB thing works, or I'm more trying to find a new mic or a new light or whatever it is, and we just answer those questions. Our view time is exponentially higher. If you look at average view times across uh, platforms, you, uh, Facebook sits at about 30 seconds, uh, YouTube a good video, six and a half minutes. And we're running um, the, uh, in, uh, you know, over a thousand of events, we're running over 70 minutes of average view time. Um, and that's a very high number um, and it's very low cost. Um, you can actually lower a lot of the production value if you increase the interactivity with the audience, because the audience just wants to be part of it. They just want to be heard. They just want to be part of that group, you know? And so when you, when you start to allow them to drive the show through questions, through chat, through all those things, um, you can actually have a discussion on Zoom and people will find that compelling as opposed to all, and I do a lot of shows where there's lots of graphics and pyro and all kinds of other things and lights and everything else. And those, those work fairly well, but they're very expensive to execute. So when you get back to economics, simply taking questions from the audience and having them know the big thing is it's hard to do when you do a one event a one-off what you wanted to be doing is patterns so every week i do it every day but every week um every month or whatever no and what happens is the training the audience is trained as well they're trained to know that if i come i'm going to get to ask questions and i or i'm going to vote on questions or i'm going to be part of that conversation and you'll find that the repeat, you know, um, you know, uh, sequential attendance and average view time, which are, the, the, in my opinion, the two most important parts of an event, are, you know, dramatically changed by simply creating all these tools that allow them to really meaningfully change the course of the of the conversation. Okay. All right. Now, so from a technical point of view, you're, you're using something that's pretty standard, realistically, an interactive chat is something that yeah, the trick, the trick is really the back end, mm -hmm. <laughs> how you deal with all those questions and how you okay. deal with all those chats. So everybody's got chat systems. Almost nobody has any, like we're sitting in a chat right now and we've got a and a system and that is the most, it's very, very rudimentary, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we, we build subsystems in to change how all the displays go to the panelists, how all the, whether they go to teleprompters, whether they're coming up in interactive displays, you know, so how do you 
make sure that those questions can be and the and the chats and everything else can be um, meaningfully managed in the back end is a, is a big piece of the problem that we have right now that that hasn't been really solved by uh, almost almost anyone. Okay. That's, that's not only about the technical tools, as you say, it's different to manage that. And it's also about the total user experience then, right? So looking at that Zoom interface here, it's kind of still not the best user experience. It somehow works, but I have different windows here for the chat, the Q&A, et cetera. And having that integrated well into a good backend, uh, which users like to use, mm -hmm. integrate that into your own business application, which you can monetize then then it, it gets a real value and gets a large opportunity uh, going beyond uh, current content and distribution. Yeah, but Nadine, I'm, I'm going to add something because it is your, we have a different slate of things that we have to think through, right? So from our side, if I want to run a certain experience, depending on what it is, and let's just say a partner says, you know, I need to, I need to run this on the TV itself. Um, and maybe that particular model that we're targeting doesn't have the memory requirements satisfied. If we go and do an upgrade to that model, right, in support of whatever this particular use case is, that cost, right, there's a certain cost to us to do that. And of course, by the time it, through the supply chain, it reaches retail, as you all know, right, that cost is no, it's, it's much higher than our own cost, right, because there's a lot of different parties to get it from manufacturing to shelves. So we have to think about often we have to think about what is that going to do to our pricing at retail? Is that going to, you know, is this use case so compelling that it's worth us taking that chance and then going to retail and then asking the consumer for a higher MSRP than if we didn't have that? So we have to balance that consideration as well. Now, on the flip of that, if we go, we really like this, uh, the utility that this use case offers, and we feel confident that the, the audience at large is going to embrace it as well. So let's just use the TV as, for example, let's use the TV as sort of a, a thin client and let's run it in the cloud, right? So we're just doing presentation on the TV. That's, that's an obvious and easy solve. Um, but the challenge there is, again, depending on the partner's business model, that has implications on their model. And then they have to figure out if if they can absorb those costs. So there's lots of different considerations where economics, there's no way you do any of this without it ultimately going back to economics. Okay. Because, yeah, because it won't let's, survive. Let's let Jennifer kind of chime in here on some of the business models and what you're seeing. Yeah, definitely. Um, maybe a little bit bigger picture when you think about it from the content provider's point of view or the uh, streaming services in particular, right? So, you know, I, I think we're we're pretty bullish on um, seeing more interactivity, particularly on advertising and particularly on commerce, because of the shifts towards more ad supported viewing in general, right? I mean, we're definitely in a moment in streaming that um, we, there is a, a major push towards base building, get as many subscribers as you can. And then, you know, uh, chickens coming home to roost a little bit on, well, where's the profitability, where are the revenues? Um, and, and most of the major streaming services are making big changes to make, make that happen. New ad supported tiers coming out. So I think that we're going to see, you know, um, a real push to see if we can uh, complement those revenues um, on the advertising side with more interactive shopping and, and commerce. The other piece that we see most uh, streamers really focusing on, of course, is churn. I'm kind of interested in hearing from the others on this too, on how interactivity features could potentially decrease churn for service providers, because that is such a, a huge issue as subscribers come in and out and then out of the service. Um, are you seeing that interactive features will make uh, services stickier? Um, and maybe uh, decrease some of that free trial in and out. I come in just to watch that show I want and back out. Maybe very content specific. So for instance, um, very premium uh, content. I don't want to watch The Walking Dead and have a lean-in experience. I'm told I want to be immersed. <laughs> I want to lean back. You know, I want to be scared. I don't want a, an advertisement for a bat. If you watch that, it's kind of a gruesome comment if you watch that show. But you know, I I, I want to. Um, be engaged in it, but are, you know, so maybe it's very content specific. Um, but do you guys see interactive features as a way that streaming providers can tackle some of their churn issues? 
I, I mean, I think that one of the things that Disney, HBO, and Netflix do, that they're starting to do, that we're starting to see happen um, in this is a lot of behind the scenes. So this is how we did the show. So you might see The Witcher, and then you see all the behind the scenes of The Witcher. Disney has a lot of great stuff behind the behind the scenes of Mandalorian. Still, it's not really as granular as it could be, given that you have mm -hmm. a streaming thing, you could put a lot more content up. And more importantly, you could start having live experiences. So some, some of the stuff we did some... Um, uh, some some work with National Geographic where they they actually showed the the show on the TV show and then they quickly moved to a um, in this case a Facebook event where they they um, right after the show the sh the filmmakers and some of the people that were in the in the show were answering questions from the online audience so they got to watch they got that kind of screening experience that we would have that we would see at a at a premiere. Um, and then they have the people that worked on it answering their questions directly and having a discussion live uh, in front of them. Right now, the streaming um, uh, op pro programmers don't quite have that live uh, capability, but they're you can they're all experimenting with it. <laughs> they're all thinking about it. Uh, they're all doing viewer you know view with your friends kinds of things to make it once again make it a moment. Um, but but those things have a lot of legs as far as keeping the churn down because. They're relatively inexpensive once you figure out how to get the the math to you know once you figure out how to do the live streaming you can those Q and A's with you could have ten Q and A's that are going on that happen after an episode that are little little things that people can do either in the they could do it definitely in the stream uh, or they could do it in, on a separate platform but the point is is it it allows the people who are very passionate to still have all these other things that are happening outside the core content which cost per minute is so high on on most of the content it's gotten you know once apple moved in um at a quarter million dollars uh, a quarter million dollars a minute or higher that starts to get you know the, the price of poker went way up and so everybody has to keep on rising that up so that core narrative content is extremely expensive surrounding it with lots of much less expensive live interactive events that help build more of the story around those things adds value to the core content and reduces churn we think and we think a lot of people are thinking of a lot of people are thinking about that a lot right now. Okay, I'm going to, in fact, Brian, do you have anything? Because I, I have another question for Oliver, but Brian, do you want to have, say anything else on I, Jennifer's it, question? I think Jennifer is absolutely right. I mean, I, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll just confess, like, don't interrupt me when I'm watching a dramatic series, right? It's, it's not going to go well. Uh, you know, we're, we're exploring a, as part of interactivity, watch together. We already have webcam support on our televisions. So, Effectively, you can watch with someone else and hold a video chat session while you're watching that content. I think that makes perfect sense when you're watching sports because sports, for the most part, has evolved as a communal activity. We're used to doing that in a living room, with multiple folks, right? You got a bowl of chips and you're watching a football game. That's that's normal. That's organic. When you move to something like The Walking Dead, I'm with you. I don't want to be interrupted. Um, but I think you can be very mindful about what the interactivity looks like. So in our world, if you're watching an app, let's say, right, you have one of your favorite apps open, you're watching some content. If you then decide that you want to look for content that's relevant to you in another app or somewhere else on platform, you have what we call a teardown event. Essentially, that app is taken down, and then you open another app, and that stands up that new app experience, right? It's it's very much a uh, a walled type of experience, right? You have to mm -hmm. you're tearing one down, you're moving to the other. Interactivity though could afford us content recommendations without having that tear down moment, and more importantly, that interactivity um, we can start to do things with interactive that my hope is that really changes the viewing experience in general. Right? Historically, TV has been a one size fits all broadcast solution, right? I don't, I don't know, I don't care if you're Jennifer, I don't care if you're Alex, you're gonna get the same thing, like it or not. My hope personally is that we can leverage interactive to personalize your viewing experience. So we know it's Jennifer, we know what she likes. We know that she's into Walking Dead, she likes zombies. Let's go ahead and recommend some other zombie shows for her. Um, and that's that's the goal without having to tear it tear down the app or without having to exit that that moment that you're in because you may look at the recommendations and go no I think I'm going to go ahead and stay over here with you know I won't say any okay, names but is that really interaction I mean right now you're talking more about a recommendation system aren't you it is it is but I think for us and that's yeah I want to qualify that for us interactive is it, it's more than just 
a chat session or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's basically where we can pack in AI, we can know who you are, we can present things that are relevant to you and, and keep you engaged. Um, do I think that a content recommendation is expressly interactive? No, but I do think the interactive layer itself as a vehicle offers a, a great amount of utility, including personalized, um, let's call it programmatic or, or content recommendation that's relevant to Nadine specifically. Okay. All right. Now, one of the things, so Oliver, you've got a slightly different audience here that is using um, the applications in your environment. And, and so realistically, you've got a financial commitment in a lot of these cases, right? So we're not necessarily talking about churn here, but we're talking about kind of the business model. And are your customers sharing with you information about how compelling their business model is to their audience? Yeah, some are, of course, not all details, but we get a bit inside because we also have an analytic system where we see a lot of metrics, which, which are on the one hand helps in tracking down possible issues, but on the other hand also gives some insight on the outreach and uh, the audience, etc. And we see really uh, the vast majority on mobile, so it's really mobile first uh, for everything, actually. We don't see actually almost nothing on TV, so it's mm -hmm. uh, completely, completely different to the other applications. And that means that there is an opportunity here for these kinds of application. I don't know if um, how large the audience is on TV, man, meanwhile, but more and more content goes to mobile, goes away from the lean back, sitting on the couch uh, experience. You want to enjoy things on the mobile while on commu commuting or wherever you are and do some interaction with, with, the, with the presenters. So that's interesting business models coming here. And um, that that's, yeah, that's a bit, big opportunity also for traditional content providers also to expand their audiences to additionally provide services which are directly focused on these platforms to get okay. more, um, more business out of that. So now I know you guys are all in different areas, which means that you all have kind of a different focus in terms of, of where the interactivity is is at least for your audiences but why don't we think about kind of the future where are we going with with the known things maybe not the flamethrower <laughs> but how are we recommending to people in the future to design interactive experiences for any one of these screens it's got whether it's a tv it's a mobile it's going to be something that's within an audience. I mean, right now we've got chat going on while I'm talking. It's like, aren't you guys paying attention to this panel? <laughs> <laughs> so what do we see for the future? Well, I think that one thing is in, to just what you just said is embracing the fact that there's lots of things going on. One of the mm -hmm. things that we find is that chat and Q&A specifically greatly increase average view time. You know, so mm -hmm. people having other things to do when you are when you when you only have a screen with no interactivity, you are living and dying by every pixel that you project to that screen. And in you have in our world, you have 10 or 15 seconds of being boring before someone finds something else to watch. And so when, when a lot of times we build interface heavy interaction. So we embed a video for someone to watch, let's say if, you know, and all the chat is all visible. Like a lot of people hide the chat and they hide the Q and A. We bring it all out because it gives you something else to do and to see while you're watching something that may not be moving as fast as you'd like it to. And so what we find is that the, that, that all of those things happening at the same time, allow people to constantly be shifting without changing the channel. This gets back to what Brian was talking about. What you don't want them to do is change the state of what they're doing. You want to find out how can we keep them uh, connected in the and stay in the same app st app space uh, or or web space or wherever they're at um, without going somewhere else by choice. Okay. Yeah. You know, one thing that I re I reach to now is is whether Jennifer's got research on this. But Brian's raising your hand. Okay, no, just, Brian, <laughs> you you uh, talk, Brian. Let, I have let, to let, I have to bring this up, <laughs> Alex. I saw the comment about uh, the remote, and I get it, especially when you're talking about chat. But we do have speech to text, okay, capability. So there's always where there's a will, there's a way. I, I, okay. I, I think it can't, I, it's there. Like, I think that the remote could be, the remote is, the, the remote is, is a very difficult thing to work out. Um, I don't even like the Apple, I mostly interact, I admit, into my Apple TV and I, I don't even like that remote. I don't, I don't think yeah. anyone's really figured out remote, you know, yeah, but, yeah. But and it's Alex... a huge part of the problem because 
you open it up and you got a bunch of buttons and you're like, I, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> or you hit the interactive button and now you get a whole bunch of other things that you didn't want. And I think that that, that is where companies like LG really, that's the a big opportunity for Innovate. innovate. I, we're already there because you know, here's what I'm saying. I'm going to push my wares and I'm going to, I'm going to uh, brag a little bit, but you know, LG TVs, we have the magic remote, right? Which is that free air cursor. So I agree with you up, down, left, right, enter is not the most ideal mechanism for a lot of these things but we have some things that and, in place that actually do aid and, uh, a better experience and i will say i i have a bunch of lg um all, all <laughs> and i love that cursor <laughs> the cursor is, so that the lg has innovated there where you can move the cursor around and select what you need it makes a huge difference and but you know that's I, I think that harks back to what i was saying like if there's an issue right then we just we just figure it out all right you get creative and you figure it out okay so we're, we're talking about what can we recommend in the future Mm -hmm. what, what are some of the things Jennifer like what do you think that that people who you do research with would want to see yeah so just to, to hop in on what they were saying our data does show an increase in use in voice for tv control mm -hmm. so using that voice feature of the remote to get to what people want faster because navigation is such an issue and because that input is such an issue um I think in the future I think uh, maybe one of the challenges that really needs to be addressed is identification so in a mobile platform, you're really doing a personal video interactive stream and you know that that person, that individual, who that individual is. And if you're doing a personalized experience or you're doing chat, it's a one-to-one -one ratio, right? On the TV, you have a larger issue where you may have social viewing, you may have a whole family watching a sporting event, right? And so is the interactive experience that we're building um, something that's great for a group like in sports? which is perfect, or does it need to be more personalized? And then how do you identify who's, who's viewing, right? Do they have to select the profile, which plenty of people don't set up a profile for every app, for every screen, for everything that they're viewing, right? Is it camera-based? Is it voice-based? Um, I think that uh, personalized, very easy user interfaces is what I wanna see in the future, but I do think there's kind of an identification piece when it comes to TV that's gonna be the key to, to really getting us to some really cool new experiences. Okay, yeah. all right, now, uh, Oliver, we're not all on TV, right? We're, we're also in the mobile environment. So what are the things that you're thinking about in the future that you'd like to see your customers being able to develop for? TV. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, as you said, uh, second screen. I would I would say mobile is first screen for us and all customers. <laughs> but anyways, the uh, it's a great uh, it's a great opportunity and challenge as well um, to further expand on and be creative on providing content. So the audience wants to be entertained somehow, even in in uh, enterprise corporate spaces. They want to somehow enjoy the content and be interactive and. Um, how the content is presented and how you can interact with that in terms of user interface, user engagement, uh, user experience is, makes makes a big difference. So I've, I've seen exciting content in town hall meetings in the corporate space where the presenter, the CEO is really engaging the audience, giving them insight into what, what they do and uh, engages them to ask questions and directly interact with the questions which are coming in. And they do it with uh, simple, reliable tools like the platform, the video platform, which is just the video element on the screen and additional some very simple Q&A things like Slido, for example, can provide. So there's really simple things available, but additionally, there's a great chance to also improve on the user experience for uh, certain new use cases and get more engagement on the content you can provide. So it's not only the technology, it's also the whole end-to-end -end experience, which you need to have in control, but which also needs to run stable. So content owners can rely on the systems they're using. Okay, we have a question from the audience. I'm gonna break into the, the TV versus mobile argument here. And 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 the other discussion is more about the, what we're calling second screen, but let's go to Gary first. Okay, how many of the interactive features that are offered are based on a real research um, about what people want versus offering something that is possible to do? Well, that's an interesting question. Do people want primarily passive viewing experiences or really want the ability to control, drive the experience more directly? Are people fundamentally lazy and really don't want to make this effort to be interactive with friends and groups? Okay. I, I think that one thing I will say there is, is and, and I know that we have people from research, as, as I'm not a researcher, I just do a lot of events. <laughs> so, so most of my experience is mostly just from uh, actual like doing it. And I find that research is very hard to do in a in this environment because people say things that are not 
can that are not um, in parallel to what they actually their actual actions. Um, and so what we're always doing is changing these things. And we've been changing them for the last 15 years to figure out those kinds of things. What I will say is that narrative and non, you know, narrative and, and uh, nonfiction are very different worlds. So when you talk about, we haven't found much success at all in narrative. So, so write your own story or do those other things that have been largely a disaster because it's really, really hard to build all the branches and it's really expensive and then no one uses them. And so, so it's a, it's a huge uh, money suck to do that where, where we do see an enormous amount of interactivity is dealing with things that people care about, that they're passionate about, whether it's cooking or history or Photoshop or whatever that is. And we have to remember back in the old days, but there was used to, we used to talk about this a lot there. When you went to the borders bookstore or Barnes and Noble or whatever, the fiction section was one little section and the rest of the entire bookstore was nonfiction. And so we have to remember that, that, you know, we think a lot about that, but we, when we look at what's actually happening, what people are actually buying in bulk, we're really talking about nonfiction, about things that they care about. And in those areas, there's lots of opportunities to, you know, build communities. And I think that the thing we really have to think about as we look forward is that we're not, you know, a lot of people will say content is king, but it's not. It, community is king. Content is the honeypot. You know, so, yeah. so content pulls you in, but you have to figure out as we build these interactive systems, how do we use those to build a community, build ongoing interaction and, and an ongoing um, connection uh, to the audience that we're serving? Okay. Just from the research side, I'll just really echo what Alex is saying, that a lot of these very innovative features, um, they're experiential in nature, right? So you can ask consumers questions all day long about what they might like, right? But oftentimes they have to experience it first, and then you can ask something similar to this experience. We're doing a lot of research, for instance, on metaverse, and consumers don't know what that is, but you can ask them about their Snapchat filters to get to AR. You can ask about certain virtual reality or cryptocurrency and pieces of the metaverse that they may have experienced to understand what might be next. Um, so sometimes there is a little bit of a build it and try it first and then see what part of that is compelling and then move to the next thing. Okay. Well, it's, you know, it's been an interesting conversation with you all. We kind of have to wrap it up because they're going to come back and tell me that we have to wrap it up. But any last thoughts? I know Eric's like, Noah, you've got any last thoughts? We'll go around really quickly. Alex, you, you said some interesting things. Just give us 10 seconds of whatever it is you're thinking in terms of this field. Uh, when it comes to media, interactivity is the next big thing. Okay. This is, Oliver? This is Oliver? <laughs> yeah, that was uh, almost the best uh, final words to hear. But uh, there, we, we see so many different applications here. It's really exciting to see that uh, growing uh, all around the different industries and applications. So that's a great opportunity. So encourage our audience to work on these things. Okay, cool. Jennifer? I see more innovation and ad-based interactivity just because so much more of the money and the focus is on making ad revenues work. Okay, Brian, you got the last word here. Oh, the last word. That's a lot yeah. of weight. Um, no, I think we just, we're just keen on introducing the world at large to the best viewing experience that we can, we can bring to bear. All right, cool. We're done. Unfortunately, we got no more time. Thank you, Eric. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. That was a terrific discussion, as I knew it would be. Uh, going back to the top of the hour, the winner of Name That Tune is Arturo Ledesma, who came in first with the identification of Ramsey Lewis's cover of Stevie Wonder's Living for the City. Arturo, nice job, and keep your eye out on your email for that gift card information. Thanks again to Signiant for sponsoring this whole week and to NanoCosmos for sponsoring this session. We'll be back at 11.30 a.m. Eastern when the one and only Evan Shapiro will be moderating a round table on brave new monetization strategies. See you then. Perfect. Thank you very much, Eric. Take care.